Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, March 28th, 2024. We're pretending it's Friday. It's the end of the day. It's the end of the work week for many of us in the United States. The boys are here. It's time for the Intelligence Community Roundtable with Ray McGovern and Larry Johnson. My dear friends, thank you very much for accommodating uh, this shortened week and joining us today on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, Larry, I'll start uh, with you first. Why are the EU and the U.S. so adamant about who committed the crimes on the Crocus uh, um, uh, concert and who did not commit the crimes at the Crocus concert? It's an intelligence community covert, uh, covert action, a propaganda campaign. It's designed to lie. Think about this. The, neither no country in NATO, neither the United States, none of them have a single investigator, liaison officer on the ground in Russia with the Russian investigators. Yet everybody is blessed with amazing clairvoyant powers that they can magically know exactly what evidence the Russians have, and they know that it clearly exonerates uh, Ukraine. It's just, it's utter crap. It's a lie. And it's one of the most clumsy lies I've ever seen. Because instead of the, the professional approach would be, you know, we don't know who did it, but we're going to work with the Russians to help investigate because we passed information that claimed that there was going to be a terrorist attack. So we want to get to the bottom of this too. Now, that's not what they're doing. This, this entire operation is designed to try to attack and weaken Putin. That's what it's all about. And the, and the Brits and Americans didn't give a damn how many Russians they killed in the process of trying to do that. Uh, Ray, in, in the real world where there are normal relations, where uh, the State Department and the Russian foreign ministry speak with each other, where the president doesn't call of the United States doesn't call the president of Russia insulting names and says he's got to be removed from power. In that real world, wouldn't we at least have offered uh, FBI investigators and CIA on the ground to help get to the bottom of this? Unless, of course, we were trying to mask our own involvement. Well, in the ordinary course of events, we would do that. We would do precisely that. Uh, but as Larry says, this is not the ordinary course of events. Uh, when Bartnikov, uh, the head of the KGB successor for internal, was well, the FBI equivalent, when he says casually in a corridor conversation that the U.S., U.K., Ukraine were involved, he wouldn't say that without Putin's blessing. I believe that indicates they have pretty good evidence now that they're waiting. They're waiting to make even more concrete and show to the world what happened. That's what I think. I think Larry is 100% correct. Larry, um, the person Ray is speaking of who's the head of the FSB. This right. is not like a Chris Ray who makes speeches all over the place and appears on television all the time. This is a guy that never appears in public. And yet he told Russia today exactly what Ray just yeah. said. A, yeah. isn't that profound? B, doesn't that mean there's evidence? C, doesn't that mean that Putin authorized him to say this? Yeah, I would say yes to all of the above. Uh, look, what's going on here is uh, this is this has been stage managed by the West. Notice now the line that's coming out of the White House and out of the State Department and out of the front pages of the New York Times, and sad to say, out of Cy Hirsch's latest substack. The, the story that's being pushed is, oh, we're the United States. We told the Russians what was going to happen, and they dropped the ball. They ignored this intelligence. They didn't. They Their security services suck. They didn't do anything to protect the Russian people. Vladimir Putin, is he's just a bad president. Okay, that's the storyline that's being put out. Let's look at what was exactly said. On March 7th, the U.S. Embassy released to a warning, and it said very simply, stay away from public gatherings, particularly concert halls, for the next 48 hours. At no point 
during that announcement or in the succeeding days did the State Department, the Biden administration, the FBI, the CIA, or anybody come out and say, okay, guys, our, our 48 hours was wrong, but we still believe the threat is viable, so stay away from public places. Didn't say that at all because they had an obligation to say that if they still believed the threat was viable. They, this 48-hour window, I think, was com was a complete fabrication because they knew when it was going to take place. They knew it wasn't going to take place then. And therefore, they get to come back and say, see, we told you so, but they didn't tell him so. They didn't call the Russian ambassador into State Department to brief him on it. So this, uh, I, again, I am furious over this because this is a complete manipulation of facts and it's based upon lies. Uh, Ray, if, if they manipulated facts, as Larry has argued, and it appears they uh, they did, what are they trying to cover up? Their awareness of the fact that Ukraine uh, intelligence services, which are wholly owned subsidiaries of MI6 and CIA, knew about it, and therefore their bosses knew about it. Yeah, and that they were running the attackers. Uh, Running the attackers. That's right. I mean, these four Tajiks are not going to do this stuff all by themselves. That's why Putin keeps re keeps insisting, look, we know who the people who perpetrated this was, but we don't know on whose behalf, who was supporting them, who was arming them, and so forth. So, no, there is a logical explanation, in my view, as to why this 48 hours thing was set in, in, in blood, really. Um, there was a great big concert planned for the ninth, I believe. So two day within 48 hours, it was right. the, it was the uh, Taylor Swift of, <laughs> of Russia, okay? And everyone was expected to be there, including some high muckety mucks, as my Irish grandmother would say, all right? so. That, that seemed to be the key time that this thing would happen. Now, we know that security was reinforced to the point that there was a, a, a SRV person for every three other people. At that, and so it was called off, apparently. Now, there is suggestions that uh, everyone kind of said, oh, well, we don't have to worry that anymore because the whole point of this was to do something to disrupt the Russian elections, which didn't take place until the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Got it? Okay. So you can see where Putin himself might have said three days before the election, well, you know, this is a kind of provocation. I don't know why the, the U.S. did this. Uh, and then, lo and behold, on the 22nd, you get the... Uh, the attacks. Now, did the Ukrainians go ahead without further instructions? I don't know, but let's face it, the, the Ukrainians. If the Tajiki did this uh, without further instructions, I strongly doubt that. Uh, at least they were not called off, it seems to me. Or maybe it was uh, sort of uh, momentum that couldn't be stopped. But that's the way I reconstruct it. And that's why the 48 hours seem to be really key because this key concert, Taylor Swift, Russian brand, was going to take place on the 9th. Here's uh, President Putin just two days ago who reinforces precisely what Ray just articulated. We know that the crimes were committed by radical Islamists whose ideology the Islamic world itself has been fighting for centuries. We also see that the U.S. through various channels is trying to convince its satellites and other parts of the world that according to their intelligence there is no trace of Kiev in the Moscow terrorist attack, that the bloody terrorist attack was committed by followers of Islam, members of the ISIS organization banned in Russia. We know by whose hands this atrocity against Russia and its people was committed. We are interested in who ordered it. We are interested in who ordered it. The other translation is we are interested in who the customer was, Larry. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean look. Is, it, is, it, is it conceivable? Between the two of you, there's a lifetime of experience in American intel. 
And I mean that with deference and respect. I'm not commenting on anybody's age. Two lifetimes. <laughs> two, pro two professional lifetimes. Yeah. Is it conceivable that the mentality of the Jack Devine side of these things is such that they didn't give a damn about the slaughter of 140 innocents, mainly young people, Ray? I'm afraid the answer to that is, uh, Judge, not not very much. I mean, oh. when you when you're on orders, you know, and you can you have the capability to blow up the Nord Stream pipeline for God's sake, and you say, "Yes, sir, I can do that." What's to prevent them from allowing Tajikis? responsive to Ukrainians trained in Turkey under our auspices, what's to prevent them and say, well, it's not going to be tied to us. Or we'll deny it, right? We'll blame the Tajikis. Uh, you know, it's very cynical, but these guys, you know, don't really care much about uh, the effects of their actions. Just they can do, they can do, and they will do. And they, whoa, look what we did. That's the mentality. Is there any significance to uh, Tajikistan uh, Larry, is there any significance to uh, ISIS-K that the uh, State Department came out with within 55 minutes? It wasn't Ukraine. It was ISIS-K before they had any evidence whatsoever. Yeah. No, I mean, they, they were just, I think the, the decision had been made in advance. That was going to be the group that committed it. Uh, and they knew that the, the, the way the Ukrainians arranged this is they had a cutout. And that cutout then was directed to recruit these uh, four characters. What do you they mean were, by cutout? Somebody that wasn't directly affiliated with Ukraine. So the uh, this uh, guy, the you know the the head of the IS Khorasan uh, in Afghanistan, uh, okay. preach online preacher. You know, was directed to reach out to these guys that and uh, recruited them and convinced them to to operate. But the, you try to put distance between yourself. But there's still always uh, there's always a, a trail that you can follow particularly the fact that they get reportedly were paid with cryptocurrency. You know, people think cryptocurrency is, uh, you know, secret and you can hide everything. That means you don't understand blockchain. <laughs> blockchain, you, every transaction is recorded. So you, it's just a matter of walking back to see who did what. So this was, this was clearly an operation. The United States started distancing itself from this operation two days before the attack. We know that because of the article that appeared in the Financial Times and then the uh, the uh, tweet that was sent out by this OSI defender on uh, 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 3.30 in the morning on the on the 22nd when the bomb went off. Uh, both of the articles carried the message, oh, U.S. officials are really concerned about these unauthorized brazen attacks by Ukraine. OK, so the United States knew it was coming. And they were trying to distance themselves and I, we're outraged. Just, you know, it's like that scene from a Casablanca. Uh, police chief is gambling in the casino. I am outraged. And he here's your winning, sir. Shocked. So same thing. Same thing. Oh, shocked. <laughs> uh, Ray, do you think that the West has recognized the utter failure of its efforts to use Ukraine as a battering ram with which to drive President Putin from office and has now resorted to asymmetric warfare, which includes the slaughter of innocent civilians inside Russia? I believe that this incident would suggest that, but it also can be looked at sui generis in and of itself. Uh, things are going really badly in Ukraine, to be sure, for the Ukrainians, the UK, the US, and NATO. Uh, yet there was a Russian election coming up. And where all kinds of provocations actually strikes within Russia before the before the campaign ended, and then this uh, golden opportunity to show how defenseless Russia was uh, for people who want to kill uh, 140 young people. Okay, so I, I read that in that context. Now, what's Putin going to do now? Well, I believe he'll assemble all the evidence and he'll bring it to the to the court of, of public opinion at the UN, probably. And I don't know what kind of reception he'll get. I don't think he's going to go off half cocked because the Russians have already won in Ukraine. And there's one other thing I would add, and that is he spoke yesterday to airmen, to pilots. And he said, look, he said, 
these F-16s, you know, these F-16s, you know, they're nuclear capable. So if they come into the fight, they're gone. They're going to be destroyed. And the airfields from which they fly, they're going to be destroyed too. And that includes airfields of friendly to Ukraine neighbors. So the, the die is cast, and I would add one little, little thing here. Uh, when Biden was told by Zelensky, who came to this meeting in the Far East, he says, oh, we lost Bakhmut. Oh, we, we, we lost Bakhmut. Biden immediately, without consulting any advisors, says, all right, well, now we're going to send in the F-16s. All right? So it's the same day, okay? That was what, May of last year or July? It was, it was a year ago, okay? Now, they don't make any sense. As, as Putin says here, we got pilots that can destroy those things, and we've already begun working on destroying their airfields, says Putin yesterday. So, you know, this thing is going to escalate unless the U.S. realizes that the game is up. Uh, but Putin is not going to strike any foreign capitals until, he, until he's so provoked. Well, He's going to strike airfields first, okay? And he's not going to use nuclear weapons. And that is a canard. That is a false flag raising the use of low-yield <clears throat> nuclear weapons because Russians don't have to do that. The U.S. may feel it has to do that. Here's uh, Dr. Gilbert Doktorov. Doktorow, I don't know if you guys know him. Mearsheimer yep. says he, though Mearsheimer has clashed with him, he's a well-respected student of Russia, PhD professor, American who lives in Brussels. Chris, play uh, 15 uh, and 16, where uh, Professor Doctorow attempts to connect the dots, including, as he calls her, Madame Newland. We note that several uh, related facts, Madame Newland, Victoria Newland, was, with, was fired on the 5th of March. It's highly uh, interesting that this coincidence hmm. i have i and others have spoken of her connection with the german uh generals plotting a strike on the on the Kerch bridge using their uh their cruise missiles hmm. however it is more likely that she was fired because she because the mission that she had supervised to uh to attack russia a terrorist attack hmm. uh using islamic extremists on the 8th of march was no longer operable. They are working on on uh, expanding further the information leads they have now on the connections with ISIS in Istanbul, mm. on the timing of the American warning that they uh, to the to Russia that a terrorist attack could take place. Let's remember that was on the seventh of March. Mm -hmm. That's to say, two days after Victor Victoria Nuland was fired, mm. and one day before the planned execution. Hmm. of the of the terrorist attack uh in in moscow so the bits and pieces the dots are taking are falling into place i repeat that mr bortnikov would never dare to say what he said yesterday mm -hmm. without the blessing of mr putin and mr putin has always been a very cautious player Ari, does this event whoever whoever caused it whoever paid for it whoever orchestrated it put pressure on Putin to be more aggressive in the execution of the war in Ukraine? No, but I, I, listen, I think Dr. O is wrong. I mean, he's he is engaged with wild speculation with respect to Vicki Newland. Oh, she was fired? Sorry, I don't buy it because okay. she already had a job lined up, number one. And I've heard people make this analysis that, oh, she missed out on the deputy secretary job. So, you know, that's why, you know, they didn't fire her for that, and she didn't get in that job was not her goal. She had the second most powerful job in State Department after Secretary of State as Undersecretary for Political Affairs. I think she saw the disaster coming and wanted to get out before it happened because she could get blamed for it. I, I think that's another plausible scenario here. But uh, that doesn't discredit what's been said about Bortnikov uh, and his comments to the public. I mean, that's an objective fact. We all saw him say it, and he wouldn't say that without uh, having the approval of Putin. And one, and then, frankly, they wanted to get the word out that they know there was U.S. involvement, there was U.K. involvement. But this, you, you know, if the CIA planned this, Vicky Newland's the last person they're going to talk to about it. Would would the event itself put pressure on Putin 
to be more aggressive, to uh, to level buildings in in Kiev, to go farther west, Larry. No, I mean, look at what Russia has been happening on the ground. And again, this notion, oh, they killed civilians. What's been going on since 2014? The Ukrainians have been killing civilians. And since 2022, they've been killing civilians in Russia with U.S., British, French and German weapons. So this, yeah, this attack was in Moscow. Yeah, it was high profile. But the fact of the matter is the act of killing civilians by the West, that's been going on for two years. And the Russians are pursuing their military strategy accordingly. I think the only thing that's changed is that now Russia is not going to avoid hitting NATO command centers that are anywhere inside Ukraine. Just, they just hit one the other day in Chasif Yar. Uh, Ray, the Kremlin yesterday, we all talk about, because we're all students of Orwell, the sig significance of words and terminology. The Kremlin yesterday changed what it has been calling the military events in Ukraine from a special military operation to a war. Is that significant from the Russian perspective? It is. It comes from the Kremlin spokesman, uh, uh, Peskov. Yeah. What was the name? Peskov. Peskov. Yeah. Okay. It comes directly from his mouth. So it's completely authorized. This is a difference. It's not a distinction <laughs> without a difference. It's exactly how the Russians look at it now. So uh, with respect to the question as to whether Putin will feel more pressure to do more in Ukraine, the answer I would give is yes. The more operative question is, will he succumb to that pressure? The answer I will give to that is no. <laughs> I think Gil Doctoro, who I know quite well, is quite right in saying that Putin is a very measured, measured person. Okay, now will he will he strike out at NATO airfields in NATO countries? No. Will he strike out? that feels capable of, of uh, accommodating F-16 in Ukraine. Yes, and he has already begun doing that, okay? So we'll see the decision centers uh, bombed with more regularity. Putin has the upper hand. As I say, it, it's really, I can't imagine why our leaders, that the the neophytes in advising Biden can't see that the, that the fat lady should begin to sing. Now, the last thing I want to say is this. Wait a minute. The fat lady's up at Columbia University now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said I it. I did. I couldn't you're resist. Welcome. I knew what you were both thinking. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to that. Now, let me just say this. That the fat, well, uh, Victoria Newland on the 31st of January said in an impromptu press conference in the middle of the street in Kiev, Mr. Putin is in for some nasty surprises on the battlefield you watch, okay? Now, uh, that was January 31st. She was talking to Budanov, the head of uh, Ukrainian military intelligence at the time, as well as Zelensky and the others. And uh, it's not a stretch to think that she would be... Uh, be very close in touch with the Jack Devines of this era, and that she uh, was kind of uh, quite quite uh, in in league with Bartnikov, not Bart, yeah, Bartnik, uh, not Bartnikov, Bartnikov, the guy who uh, was running it Bartnikov. from the inside, as as I as I believe. So right. So I don't think it. I think your key uh, judge is the fifty-five minutes. I mean, <laughs> it speaks volumes. How can they know in 55 minutes it was in Ukraine and it was ISIS? Give me a break. Larry, what will happen if uh, President Macron of France is foolish enough to send 2,000 troops to uh, Ukraine, combat uh, troops? He Won't they be taken the out as soon as the Russians can do so? He'll learn the lesson that Napoleon learned. Don't invade Russia. Don't send, don't send French troops to Russia. Because they, they won't make it out. Uh, and, and, you know, the more I think about this, I, I think it's going to be unlikely for him to do so. Because if he does that, he's going to really screw up the Olympics this summer. And I think the last thing he wants to do is, is throw a wrench into the Olympics. The Olympics are in Paris this summer. Yeah. 
So uh, to make that a disaster. But if he does it, you know, the, the Putin has made it very clear: we're gonna we'll kill him. And if they're if they're in a mili- if they're if they're involved militarily in any form or fashion, in fact, they've already killed French soldiers, French mercenaries. And as uh, Ray was pointing out, even before the terrorist attack on the twenty second, the the Russian military had stepped up its attacks on power pr- producing plants. So they're taking those out now. So Kharkiv has been in the dark now for about uh, two weeks, and. Lights aren't coming back on. Gentlemen, thank you very much. No matter what we talk about, it's a pleasure. I I, uh, welcome all of your insight all the time, whether we all agree on every detail or not. And Larry, thank you for what you said about uh, Cy. I mean, when you sent me a paragraph of what Cy wrote, I thought I was misreading. I had to read it three times to make sure that You had it right, that I read it right, that there wasn't a negative missing. But even somebody like Sai, who was the courageous and brilliant enough to expose the Nord Stream pipeline, can sometimes uh, fall for this stuff. Yeah, he just, oh, he's getting fed by intelligence source, the same ones that were feeding it to the New York Times. And it's it's not just an odd coincidence that Sai's article comes out same time the New York Times article comes out with the same message. You know, when you see that, you know that there's information operation going on. Do you know him, Ray? I do. He's a good friend. Um, I would just simply say this, that uh, my dad, the lawyer, had a frivolous phrase that he invented, the age of statutory senility. Okay, (laughs) He quit about seven boards of directors when he was 70. That's what he said with the age. You said the rest of you should quit too if you're over well, 70. You know, the, the viewers should know your father was not just a lawyer. Your father was a brilliant professor at Fordham Law School who taught many of us, even those of us that didn't attend Fordham Law School, because we read his works while we were studying at other law schools. So you're being modest. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Go ahead. It's the age of statutory solidity, so nobody thinks. I still think it's seventy. It's now five years uh, from where I am. It's age ninety. Okay, so please listen to me for the next five years. If you, you got it, at least that, <laughs> at least that long, uh, gentlemen. Happy Easter to both of you and to your Thank families. You. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for pretending this is Holy Thursday. Thanks for pretending it's a Friday. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Have All a good good Easter. Thank you. And happy Easter to everyone uh, for watching. It's been a, a, a challenging and rewarding week because so many of you uh, have tuned in. Back to the old routine next week. Happy Easter. Justin Napolitano for Judging Freedom. <laughs>